Maybe we'll get started. We've got a fair bit to get through. Um, so I'll just start off with a disclaimer. So the, con the content in this session is valid at the date of the presentation. The information presented in this educational session is provided by Avant Law. Please note that Northwest Melbourne at PHN does not endorse, sponsor or verify the content shared. The views and information presented are solely those of the presenter and may not reflect the official stance or opinions of Northwest Melbourne PHN. Attendees should use their own discretion when considering the information presented and the information in this presentation does not constitute legal advice, accounting advice or other professional advice and should not be relied upon as such. Start off with an acknowledgement of the country. So the Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our work takes place, the Wurundjeri people, the Wurundjeri people and the Bunurong people. And we'd like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Some housekeeping uh, rules. So you will all be muting, muted for this part of the presentation. Uh, you'll be able to unmute yourselves to ask questions. Uh, that's a point, point later on in the presentation. Um, and you can also ask questions in the chat box. So the session's being recorded and um, please ensure that you change your name to reflect the name you registered with so we can mark your attendance. Um, this is so we can send you your CPD points and certificate of attendance after the session. This is how you change your name in the so you should be able to just hover over your name or click the little dots next to your name to change it. If you have any issues, just uh, pop a little message to my colleague and she'll help you out. Okay, so now I'll present our speakers for today. So Dr. David Williams is the General Manager of Event Practice Solutions and a practice, practicing neurologist. Since 2010, he has managed his own practice, which has now 40 doctors over five sites. Drawing on his this experience, he founded Event Practice Solutions, which supports hundreds of practices across Australia with practice management consulting, offsite reception support, and medical bookkeeping. David works closely with his experienced team of practice managers to deliver high, highly efficient services to improve practice performance. And Marco Novikov is a senior associate in the commercial and corporate law practice at Avant Law Commercial. He has extensive experience in private practice and in-house legal roles, advising on commercial transactions and disputes, privacy and corporate governance, and business structuring. Since 2023, Marco has focused on assisted clients in the health industry, offering solutions-focused advice to help them achieve strategic and commercially sensible results. So over to you. I'll just let you guys share your screen. Thanks, Abby. I'll just bring up screen number one uh, and uh, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to um, join my uh, friend and colleague, Marco, who often works next to me here at um, Avant Central in, in Melbourne. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I run the Avant Practice Solutions business and part of that business is focused on supporting doctors in uh, managing their practices. Um, we've all said at least several times in our lives that we went to medical school to become doctors and not become business owners. Uh, and somehow I've made the transition um, because I'm interested in trying to get things right. Uh, one, of our, one of our uh, workmates, um, Dr. Michael Wright has become the uh, new head of the college uh, just this week. Uh, and one of his passions is helping business operations inside general practice throughout Australia. And I guess it's with that spirit and encouragement, um, I've chosen the topic tonight to look at viability in general practice. Uh, it's a crisis in some businesses, some areas, um, even well-run businesses can take on board some of the um, philosophies and approaches to considering viability that I'm going to go through over the next half an hour of the talk. Um, my credentials as a business manager come from experience. I've had some formal training, um, perhaps not as much in the field of neurology as I have in business, but what I do do is run a team of really expert practice management consultants that work on business strategy, um, efficiency processes, um, business plans, uh, accreditation, 
uh, and human resources. And it's that knowledge that I'd like to bring to you guys tonight. Uh, feel free to throw out some questions. We'll have a chance to answer um, in a bit of a forum at the end, but also keep an eye on the um, the questions that come up along the way if we um, uh, if they come up. So let's look at the viability of general practice and fundamentals, best practice, and how you can deal uh, dial into your strategy and take on some of these learnings. Um, we there we go. We've acknowledged the country, uh, and I'm coming from um, the the lands of the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri people as well. Um, let's start with a sort of general overview of what we're trying to achieve here. And again, this is not supposed to be patronizing. There's many practices and practitioners here who are probably running very good practices. Um, there's practices uh, that will find some stresses either uh, in operations, in human resources or in finances. And these are general principles that I'd like to, to take away tonight. But when we think about viability of any general practice, I think about it in, in four realms, really. The first is, is there a need for a service? It's a kind of obvious question and you know, really obvious for a single GP in a, in a small country town. Um, uh, and you know there aren't enough doctors in Australia, so the answer is almost always yes, but it's the consideration around this question. Um, the second thing is, there might be a need for a service, but is there a sustainable workforce? Are there doctors other than you um, to work in the practice? Are there uh, administration staff to support the practice? Uh, and are there the necessary human resources to be able to run a healthcare, a primary healthcare service in the area that you're looking at? Once those considerations have been met, and we're going to go through these in detail, um, then we have to ask the question, can the practice generate revenue? Now that's uh, maybe that's a trite statement, uh, and it's but it's much more complicated than it looks. Um, answering this question gives us an idea about how to set up the business and the facilities to be able to um, receive the money, uh, document the money, govern the money, uh, and have the the, um, the the infrastructure around that to deliver the service that um, that is worth the money. And then finally, after all those things have been considered, and when we're thinking about the viability of a general practice simply can the business produce a profit? And that's not always the case in general practice uh, and particularly for the, the principal owners in the in the room here tonight. Sometimes uh, we end up paying a bit more of our service fees to keep the practice afloat rather than take home um, the same amount of money that perhaps some of the doctors working uh, at the practice might be um, might be taking. So let's go through each one of these perspectives and, and put a business lens over it. Um, asking about the need for service, I really want to take um, the, the doctors in the room a little, I want you to separate your practice of medicine from the business of medicine. So here it's not whether or not you have a worthy skill set that is able to be applied to the, to the community. It's really, is there a business opportunity here? And too often we equate the business opportunity that we are providing as doctors with the practice of medicine that we do. Really, through this talk, I want you to try and separate the business notion from your ability to provide good quality care, because that is really what underpins the viability of a practice um, on the metrics that I've set already. So thinking about from the community perspective, naturally we would think about the population, the demographics, the other practices or choices that um, consumers, healthcare consumers could make. Um, are there unmet needs in the community? Um, do you offer an amenity that's going to attract um, patients to come and spend time speaking with you, waiting in your waiting room or, or um, dealing with your administration staff? And what is the personality of the practice? Does it fit the community needs uh, and address some of their concerns? And if you think through this, uh, I dare say there's many practices that do consider these components when they're set up, but even after you're established, I think it's worthy of reviewing whenever you review your business plan, which I would argue should be an annual activity, that you talk through these things in your mind. Is your business viable given the current demographics, population, competition, the consideration of unmet needs, the amenity that you're presenting in the practice, the accessibility, um, for different types of patients you need, and also what is the practice personality. 
that really talks to whether or not you have a need that is going to meet the community expectation. And from the purely business perspective, is there a need for the service? Well, what service are we talking about? Um, we're talking about primary care. Many practices will also look at different types of components of that. So are there special interests in the group of GPs that are practicing and are those interests needed? Is there need for another skin clinic or another travel clinic? Um, is there enough uh, female doctors to address the needs from the community? Um, is there a special interest in, in sports or, or pediatrics that uh, meets an unmet need? Those considerations uh, should be an active part of this first question of viability. Is there a need for the service? And then uh, overlaying that with your business plan. Hours of operation is a really touchy subject when people start practice. I guess the majority of people here in well-established practices where the hours of operations are set in stone and they're pretty well covered. However, from time to time, the availability of doctors to work some of the later hours or the weekends is a challenge. And consideration around whether or not that fits into what you can supply the community and fits into the business plan should also be made when you're thinking about viability. Is it worthwhile stretching out your small group of GPs that can't cover the, the busy hours to have them um, also available for longer hours for just to meet um, requirements for being open till eight o'clock, for example, because that's what it says on the front board of the, of the practice. And then in terms of the needs of the practice, it'd be, it would not be unusual for doctors uh, or people starting up a practice to have visions of have a big physiotherapy lab or a speech therapist who, who turns up twice a day or a psychologist is going to rent out rooms. But is that really does is that really a need that the practice needs to meet? Is it making it more complicated? Is it, a, is it an affectation about the ideal practice but not fit for purpose where you are? I think a... Um, a critical review of those sort of things um, when you're planning a practice and importantly an annual review of the need for those sort of additional services should be part of the the, the annual business planning process the reason is that uh, everyone uh, does have a limitation of how much they can produce and, and work they do and if you've got an administration team that's spending so much time looking after the allied services and unable to properly manage the patients to deal with uh, high billing categories or or workflows that you would prioritize, then you're gonna miss out on that sort of revenue. And then you've got a challenge for the viability of the practice. So looking through the practice from those two perspectives, the community perspective and the need for service is a really good way um, to answer that first question about you know what, what is your purpose as a practice? My tip for the doctor managers in the group is to focus the practice on what is needed by the patients, not what the doctor wants to practice. A doctor may well have the greatest spiel on psychiatric needs uh, of minors that are fly and fly out workers. But if you're working in a, a residential suburb that doesn't address that need, there's little point in trying to set aside time or even attract doctors that provide that service, for example. And I'm obviously making it up. Um, focus the practice on what you can deliver. That is, play to your strengths uh, and don't stretch past that. If there's a challenge about viability on your resources or your financial performance or, um, uh, or, or even uh, personnel, then focus on what you're really good at. That includes what the doctors are good at and what the, the community really needs, that unmet need. And engineer the services, recruit, organize, promote the services that meet a need that you've identified in the community. And don't, don't assume that need is going to stay static over years and decades. It's very likely to change as demographics change in the community and trends, dare I say it, um, or incentives and government um, programs. So you know, even those things alone um, should help you engineer your services to meet the need. So that's the sort of first question we're asking, is the service needed? And I'd suggest that you identify the need and engineer your practice and business and staff um, to, to meet that need. That's the, um, the best way to answer that from a viability perspective. Now, the biggest hassle for any practice, uh, assuming there are patients to come in the front door, is the workforce. 
and and sustainability of a workforce um, helps answer that other question about viability. Actually, can you run the practice? So thinking about a sustainable workforce for me uh, and the practices that we consult throughout Australia is really about right-sizing your administration team for the sort of tasks that are needed in the practice. Now, every single administrator in general practice is busy. Just because someone's busy doesn't mean you need to hire a new person and a new person because there's always busyness. I like to start from a strategic perspective and think about the business from a perspective, uh, from the idea of what roles does the business need and then work backwards from there rather than just try and bring in headcount to control busyness or unstrategically um, hire more people because your practice manager says we can't cope. It's always better to strip things back. And the reason that a strategic approach to this helps is that that is the first step at having sustainable workforce. If everyone's just busy doing stuff all over the all over the shop um, without much strategy, then you don't really know if you're up to date with your staffing levels. So what roles do your business need? What is the structure of your organization? When I say that um, as a as a doctor owner, you are the CEO and the board. Um, or you're probably the board, your practice manager is probably the CEO, but you need an organizational structure under that so people know what they're doing um, and that there's reliable decision-making processes. I gave a talk similar to this a couple of weeks ago um, at a college, uh, at the Avant Growth Academy. Uh, we had about um, maybe 100 doctor owners in the room and I asked everyone to put up their hand if they've ever made a decision with their practice manager in the hallway in between seeing patients. And I think we had about 95% of people put their hand up. And that's an example of a really poor decision-making process. And unfortunately, when decisions are made like that, they're not particularly strategic, but perhaps worse for the staff is that they, have, uh, they don't have an expectation of consideration and thought and logical decision-making. Staff get confused, job roles get confused and we end up having no strategy around um, what the workforce is doing. So the first rule of building a workforce is to have a strategically well-designed workforce and they're much more likely to be sustainable as in someone's comfortable and happy in their role and they're able to progress in their role. You know what's expected of them and they know what's expected of each other. And all too often we're poor people managers as doctor owners uh, and a bit of focus on that is able to keep people in the seat doing the job that you want them to do. Now, inevitably, staff change. Um, my practice manager told me that since she's been um, managing my practice, admittedly not a primary care facility, but she's actually hired 39 people um, in 10 years, which is a lot of hiring. That's a lot of turnover. And the average tenure is about 16 months of a, a medical secretary. Now, it's going to change for different practices. Equally, I would not want the same administration team as I started with 14 years ago uh, because they wouldn't, they perhaps would be 14 years older, they wouldn't be as tech savvy as the team that we have now. Uh, and to work into that reality of staff turnover, we have got very good training and onboarding materials. And this is where your policies and procedures should not be used just for accreditation every three years, but really part of the training materials and support materials to make your make sure your staff are completing their, their roles and trained well enough to be able to really be great contributors within that first one or two months of joining the team. Better satisfaction, more likely to hang around. Um, and the final point uh, on this slide is whether or not the position descriptions are fit for purpose. These things change over time, um, and it's part of that annual review process that a strategic business owner should look at is, have I got my staff doing the things that I need, and is it reflected in their position description? Um, part of what consideration comes out of that is, am I employing them the right way? Am I compliant with the, um, with the award? And that's a whole other um, kettle of fish, which we probably won't go into. Um, for Although Marco and Marco's team talks about it a lot, so look out for the Avant Law talks on employment law as well. Um, for me, um, sustainable workforce for primary care really looks at appropriate roles. So 
Um, the ner your nurses should be working as nurses. If you've got a nurse sitting at the front desk or taking telephone calls, um, you've got a problem and that will be an easy thing to address as in try and work out back what we said on the last page, what the physician descriptions are, what the structure is, and have I got the roles to find in the right way to right size your practice. Nurses are too expensive to be taking telephone calls at the front desk. Um, now let's say the nurses pick up the telephone call because the phone's ringing and the poor team at the front desk are so busy they can't do it. Well, that's where a practice management consultant or a, a, someone who's come to this talk and thought really strategically that business goes through and says, okay, what are the roles that, that we need doing here? Um, do I need my front desk staff answering telephone calls when actually they're trying to process payments, um, you know, follow up calls and do recalls and that kind of thing? Um, the answer may well be no. The answer may well be we don't have enough people on the front desk. There's a number of different ways to address that. If strategically you've got your position descriptions right, then it's possible to outsource some of those telephone answering services to Australian-based uh, people that will actually take the overflow calls so that you actually your team can be not under so much stress and they can get their work done um, appropriately. One of the approaches we have in general uh, in primary care practices um, when we're doing consulting is look for a whole of team approach to managing the patients. And the most successful practices that are making the most out of the incentives and the chronic disease management plans include not only the doctors, but also the nurses and the front desk staff in helping to identify the people that need follow-up, the type of follow-up, and to make sure that the billings um, are on time. And relieving front desk teams of the hassle and busyness of telephone calls is one easy way to open up time for them to contribute to that sort of planning and optimize your billings as well. A sustainable workforce is one that's got a reliable capability and capacity. Uh, your practice managers and should be reporting to you about your capacity and capability across the team and you should have an understanding about where you're a bit behind the eight ball or um, oversupplied in terms of admin staff so that you can make strategic decisions about this. The reason why this impacts the sustainability of workforce is that if people are doing jobs they not don't feel like they're trained to do or not confident to do, they're not going to hang around very long. Um, equally, um, if you've got people that are, are, are overutilized, busy, always doing after hours, again, their quality of work is going to deteriorate and they're probably not going to hang around very long. Uh, for people who are in more remote areas, sometimes even finding um, someone with a skill set to be able to perform the duties uh, of an assistant practice manager, practice manager or admin clerk can be a challenge. Uh, and in that scenario, there's there's many outsourced um, services that can provide those those backups. Uh, a sustainable workforce um, is, is also going to have an efficient practice manager and the administration duties are going to be well defined in terms of what the outcomes required by the business are. Simple tips here to, you know, perhaps I've used too many words, passionately talking about uh, improving general practice, but um, uh, practice operations, but that's what I do every day and I love it. Um, some simple tips. Uh, if you're doing bookkeeping in-house or you're paying your accountant $250 an hour to do bookkeeping, um, you're making, a, in general, a poor decision. Um, most practice managers aren't qualified bookkeepers and it's going to take them twice as long to do the books and as, as it will an outsourced bookkeeper. Um, so this is really low-hanging fruit to give back between you know four and eight hours a week to your practice manager to manage the practice. Just outsource the bookkeeping um, and the payroll stuff for a compliance perspective should be outside of the practice as well. Have a qualified payroll officer doing that. Um, instead of hiring more staff because you're busy, 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 look at what overflow administration services there are. It's possible to, to hire people from my team to be able to take call overflow um, for when the phones are running hot at certain times of the day. Now, if your team lacks capability when it comes to business management, like you're just getting by, good at ordering the, the toner for the printer, but not really good at strategically building a business plan or financial reporting, really do invest in that. For the for the couple of thousand dollars that a business plan and, and budget sets up each year, it really gives you a navigation tool for the whole for the whole year and is going to improve the possibility of maintaining staff and having a viable practice. Um, streamline services to doctors, that is, make sure the doctors are happy they're getting what they need, but also insist that the doctors are 
carrying the load of the practice. That is, you don't want 12 doctors all doing different procedures, different processes and different requirements for the staff. I know there is a tendency to try and keep doctors happy in the practice by bending your rules or changing your processes between doctor and doctor. This is really the most inefficient way to run a business that supports a practice for those of you who are business owners. And um, the, the probably the, the influence you can have as a business owner is try and get the doctors to do things in a very similar way. Same sort of approach to sending letters, um, following up uh, patients, following up results, um, you know, coming to clinic on time, uh, dare I say it, um, not falling behind on their patients too much, um, entering their item numbers, uh, checking their results, these sort of things. If if it's consistent from doctor to doctor, then the, the staff are going to be happier and that you're going to be more definitive on the duties that everyone needs to, um, to, to do. And I'm going to set a challenge for anyone here who has a nurse taking telephone calls for general reception. Um, set this as a priority uh, to reassign the nurse to something that's going to be more nurse-like and not admin-like um, as a hopefully not patronising tip. Um, okay, thinking about a viability of a practice, simply can the practice generate revenue? Um, the things around this, uh, it's not you being a doctor that generates revenue, it's the business making it possible for lots of doctors to see patients and generate revenue. So we take it away from the doctor owner of how good you are seeing patients or you know how much money you're generating. That's great, that's you as a doctor, but the business as a practice has to measure certain metrics and be consistent and work towards them to optimize them. Some simple approaches to this is thinking about occupancy. What proportion of the day or week is a room occupied with a doctor and a patient, um, or for some of the other rooms, nurse and a patient that generate revenue. That's a pretty simple metric. It's a single percentage, and you can measure if certainly if that percentage is higher, your revenue is going to be higher. If it's low, then you're asking the question, actually, can we generate revenue? What's getting in the way of us filling up these rooms with, with patients uh, or doctors? Creating metrics around the cost of delivering service as well. If you find that you've got so many admin staff that actually it costs you more to provide the admin than it does to generate the, than the money you can generate from um, that patient, then you've got a problem in terms of viability. And it's a fast way to actually go backwards as a business. So this is a really uh, cost analysis of um, how much does it cost? How many admin people have you got handling a patient on the way through? There's obvious software enhancements and, and um, efficiency gains that you come from um, from the, uh, the broader healthcare industry. Uh, unfortunately, the sort of money that goes through from Medicare um, and the, the price people expect to pay GPs is so low that every general practice needs to make some efficiency gains from software to be able to stay viable. And there's plenty to be gained often minimized by how much you train staff, but I would say that looking for um, reducing the administration cost per patient does come from proper utilization of software and giving advice or getting advice around that um, can be uh, really helpful in allowing you to generate revenue rather than lose revenue. Um, it's remarkable how many business owners don't understand the financial handling workflows, like where does the money go in and go out? What's the bank account? What's the FPOS process or the TARO process? How does the invoice get from your, your best practice account onto the TARO? Um, how does the patient get their money back? As a doctor owner, it's really important to have a very clear understanding about the financial handling workflows. Um, and you need to be able to have it to the point you can explain it to your spouse or your accountant or your lawyer, um, particularly if you're worried about fraud or if you get into a fraud situation. So you want to be absolutely clear about where the money flow is and how it's being tracked. That is a way to lose revenue um, by just people not caring about it um, and also to be defrauded. Um, it's the wrong time to find that there's been unreconciled bills if you've just sold out of the practice and a couple of years later, someone goes, oh, look, no one looked under the pillow here and there's a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of unreconciled bills. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have heard horror stories. They're all true. There, there are simply practices that leave millions of dollars untouched because the process isn't correct. No one thought to check it. Um, and here is, if it's the first time you've heard it, go in tomorrow morning, make sure you understand 
the financial handling work froze from end to end and don't stop until you, you're clear on who's seeing what. You can't generate revenue if it's not going into the bank account. Um, in terms of uh, utilizing nurses, um, they, they make uh, the patient experience better. They help us be doctors and they are really important for the delivery of primary care. They're a really complicated resource in they're very well trained and they have some complicated processes for actually contributing to the generation of revenue. And sometimes that revenue is a little bit in dispute in the practice, depending on, you know, where it lands and who's contributed to it. Um, a nurse utilization plan does help with that. So it's not left to chance or how good the nurse is or how good the front desk staff is. The nurse utilization plan should be something that's transparent and open to the other doctors in the practice. And so the costs and the revenue that's generated from the nurse are attributed appropriately. Um, it requires a bit of planning and thought process. But I can tell you from experience, the difference between an unplanned practice with very capable nurses and a highly planned practice with capable nurses is in the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars difference. Purely from the planning, and it's not about gaming the system with item numbers or, or anything like that. It's about the appropriate use of resources um, and lining that up with the, the medical um, facilities as well. Uh, and I've said it a couple of times already, creating a business plan and budget is the only way you can track whether or not you're able to generate revenue. You don't know if your expenses are more than your, your revenue unless you've got it um, reportable and planned out. Um, do take time um, on this topic when you're thinking about how can you, how can you understand um, what your business is doing. It's not immediately apparent, but don't, um, don't expect you'll get answers in minutes. It's often a process of undertaking, looking under the, the bonnet with trusted people, your practice manager, maybe your accountant, practice management consultant, and asking the questions so that you you sort of rejig um, your understanding of how the business works. Um, a gap analysis from a practice or business management consultant is something that can give you guidance through this. Um, Think about the doctor's efficiency. How can you support the doctors that work in your practice to be as good as possible? And some of that, sometimes that's training. Sometimes that's cultural things uh, in terms of how you want the business to operate. Sometimes it's software, and you know uh, the, the the flavor of the day uh, is AI scribing. How awesome is it to practice without taking notes um, with your fingertips? If you type, you're typing as poorly as I did, I do. Um, then AI scribes are a revelation. Um, around that so you look at those things um, quick plug if I can Abby the Avant AI scribe will be launched in a couple of weeks time and it's the only one that's fully uh, fully indemnifies the doctors against the problem so um, we're pretty excited about it coming out to market soon um, generating revenue sorry about the advertisement there um, <laughs> Generating revenue um, does require a detailed understanding of the Medicare schedule um, it's just a fact. It's complicated, uh, and uh, but it does sit behind strategy and the ability for your business to generate revenue because that's the rule book by which you play unless you're fully private outside of the Medicare system. Um, you should specifically assess your practice against the government incentives. Again, that's an obvious statement, but unless it's a reportable, unless it's a consideration for you, your practice manager and your staff, including your nursing staff, and your admin staff, then it can all too easily be missed. And once you pass a, a pay point, um, then it's hard to, to rejig that. So it has to be something front of mind that's proactively done. And it's such an important part of generating revenue that it has to be on this list. Um, so my tips for this, are, you know, use, use the best ret reporting tools you can, have a whole of team approach to revenue generation as I've touched on. Uh, and if you find that you're behind the eight ball, assign some of those strategically um, employed um, administrators to be champions of change or some of the doctors. Make sure there's people that are flying the flag for these adjustments that you want to make in the business. They're profoundly important. They're going to be more important for the doctor owners, perhaps, than the, the doctors that are only going to be working in the clinic for a couple of years. Uh, but uh, overall, the healthcare service and provision to... Um, the patients is better. Um, 
rounding up the conversation really is can the business produce a profit um, again the management needs to set goals and expectations of what is good what is a good profit and that should be profit for the business not profit for the amount of patients that the um, principal doctor has seen um, and so the the goals the financial goals um, that underpin the practice viability should be set by the mission statement of value so there is personality and this is not just about money it's actually about delivering good quality health care that i know is at the front of everyone's mind um, a budget and a business plan are essential for this um, you should always review your billing strategy and pricing um, i've been really pleased to see the evolution of pricing in general practice over the last couple of years um, but the, the number of people moving to mixed billing is great. doesn't mean that bulk billing is a horrible, dirty word. And I certainly, um, you know, I bulk bill uh, quite a lot of my patients. Nothing wrong with it. But as long as it's part of a strategy, that's fine. If it's just, you know, hoping to be the cheapest doctor in town, that's not really a strategy. Um, and I've already emphasized the need to understand the revenue sources. So um, my tips are... Um, you know, outsource the management, management duties if you don't have the capability in your practice. Take nurses off the front desk, train staff in efficiencies and set goals for them so there's some strategic approach to um, being as efficient as possible. Um, you get your practice manager yearly, annually to review utilities, phones and consumable supplier pricing. Um, for example, if you're not if you're on the same telephone system you're on five years ago, you're probably spending about six or seven thousand dollars per year too much. Um, it's money for taking if you're managed properly. Um, and if you've got if you can't generate more revenue because you you maxed out your pricing or whatever for this year, um, then do look at the expenses because you can't run a viable practice um, without having a profit as part of the um, uh, part of the deal. So um, probably I've, I've extended uh, my, my talking past the half an hour mark, um, Abby, and I don't want to cut too much into Marco's time. Um, I would um, encourage everyone to focus on the incentive payments and make that the first port of call. Hit 100% all the time. If you don't have the tools or people, um, then speak to the PHN to help you, speak to experts to help you and set up for that as a goal. Um, the takeaways really here are apply business management principles to your practice as a business. Yes, you're doing good medicine. If you're a principal doctor, I'm sure you're seeing a lot of patients, but is the business healthy? And the health of the business can only be guaranteed by business management plan, a bit like your asthma management plan, right? Um Government funding underwrites the business. We're very lucky in healthcare. Unfortunately, the government's not giving out lots of money. But do, do look at um, focusing on these incentive payments that support that, uh, which I'm sure the PHN's told you about for so long. Um, be active in managing expenses. Don't just accept them as something you have to pay. Look at pr pricing around that. Um, and look, uh, focus on revenue generating roles inside your business, really get those front desk people to, to contribute to the um, client patient uh, identification and the nurses to be proactive in generating revenue. Uh, invest in expertise, um, putting in um, five or $10,000 uh, in terms of getting an improvement and uplift can multiply the benefits. Um, uh, so many experiences of that that we've worked through in Avant Practice Solutions that it is um, I'd say it's almost guaranteed that if you're lacking capability, bringing it in is worthwhile. So um, happy to take a important question um, or if you have a question, feel free to either pop it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, happy for you guys just to talk and ask your questions over the mic if you want to. Possibly solved all of the, uh, all of the questions. <laughs> I've kept the, I mean, I've kept the topic very general. They're principle, a principle based approach, but hopefully um, the, the attendees here have uh, found that the emphasis that I've put on might've helped um, trigger a few thoughts about what they can take back into the, the practice um, our goal um, and, and with the college as well 
is to try and make sure that practices are viable um, because just simply getting more money from the government is not um, an approach that seems likely to solve the problem when it comes to um, the viability concern. Thanks so much. Uh, hand over to Marco now, I reckon. Yep, and if any questions pop up, feel free to pop them in the chat. Yeah, make sure you ask them now while you've got David and Marco here. That's what they're here for. So, yeah, feel free to ask at any time. Thanks, okay, here we go, Marco. Thank you. Thanks very much, Abigail. Thanks very much, David. Um, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity to have uh, speak to you about my expertise in the areas of payroll tax and otherwise what we do at Event Law. Before I move on to my presentation, there's just a couple of things I want to reflect upon that David was speaking about because it's relevant to what we're doing here, but also to what I will vouch for as the efficiency of David and his team with uh, event practice solutions. So David wanted to make a plug for um, the AI scribe and I want to make a plug for David's team as well. Uh, David is a great colleague. He's a great friend at work. Uh, I've been fortunate enough where I've had the opportunity to work with one of the clients of APS to help them service their legal needs. And if they didn't have any trust or faith or, or um, a positive reviews about the work from David and his team, they wouldn't have even trusted us in the first place to do the legal work for them. So um, I really stress that it, David does have the great passion that he says he does when it comes to the work he does. Um, and it's certainly efficient. The other thing that David uh, touched upon as well, which I think is important for the context of my presentation, is that you want to think about strategy. And amongst those is when it comes to things like patient billing. Uh, David pointed out that mixed billing model might be the, the way moving forward um, if you're just doing bulk billing as it relates to practice profitability and generating revenue um, on the basis that perhaps there are government incentives out there, but you may need to do more. The reason that's, I think, an important point is we know there's been a big push by the certain state governments for uh, payroll tax rebates or exemptions to apply just for those GPs that are doing bulk billing uh, services. That may not be viable for your practice, so it'll be a good idea for you to reflect upon what I'm going to discuss in my presentation. Now, David is such a great colleague, he actually offered to do the screen sharing for me. One of the things David mentioned was that, uh, you know, you didn't study uh, at medical school and become a doctor to uh, oh, necessarily worry about business administration. Well, I didn't study law school to learn how to properly <laughs> navigate Zoom and to share my slides. But David and Abigail, I think I nailed it. I had the chance to practice quickly. So I want to give it a shot. But David, being the great colleague that you are, can you please be on standby in case I don't get it right? But if I can give it a crack now, David, please. So I'll try this and see, uh, place a current share. So Abigail, I'm gonna give this a crack. Um, and so that's absolutely the wrong one. Okay, so this is it. So here we are. Now, is the display, display settings correct, Abigail? It's the notes there. Okay, so let's see if that changes anything. Perfect, yep. Have I got it? Yep, all okay, good. Okay, wonderful. So <laughs> thanks to David and Abigail, I learned something new today. Well done. Thank you, David. Great supporter, great colleague. Um, so presentation will be focused uh, for me today on payroll tax. It's obviously very topical. Um, what I want to uh, do is just briefly introduce myself for context. So the accent you're hearing is Canadian. I've been living in Australia for about 15 years. Absolutely love it here. Uh, for the past two years, I've been working specifically as a lawyer dealing with uh, the medical profession, medical industry, and clients that are doctors, practice clinics, but also veterinarians, allied health professionals, and dentists. So I'm a senior lawyer with the Vant Law Commercial. The work I do is not covered under any insurance policy with the VANT if you're an event uh, member, but to get our services, you get a 10% discount um, if you're a member. And the work we do is focused more on corporate commercial and anything not covered under the insurance policy. So uh, Abigail, 
Abigail, you did a great disclaimer. I've got one here just to confirm the same thing. I'm not giving legal advice uh, or accounting advice or professional advice. It's for educational purposes. So before I start with my presentation, there's an elephant in the room to address. So if you've been uh, staying in touch with what's going on in the news, especially in Queensland, there's a new state government and they basically said uh, that the going to tell the treasury to abolish payroll tax completely for GPs. I think that's wonderful news for practice viability for the GPs, for the college that has been very supportive of um, advocating for the either exemptions or something uh, of that like not to apply for GP clinics, given the importance that GPs serve to the community in delivering medical services. Um, and so that's certainly a big win. We'll wait to see what happens, but that's just Queensland for the time being. Other states like New South Wales have already changed their legislation to essentially say that you'll only get rebates um, or an exemption if you're doing bulk billing. And it's different whether you do it in the city or in the country, but predominantly has to be bulk billing. So there'll be a question there for you based on David's presentation about whether that's a good model for you when it comes to profit generation. So that's one elephant. Another one will be Uber case, but I'll get to that shortly as well. What's important to know based on what's happening in Queensland and the different states is to realize that payroll tax is really a state-based tax, has nothing to do with the Commonwealth or with the ATO. It's basically handled by the state revenue offices in each state. Where all of this is generated from is the contracts between the medical practice and the doctors. Typically, medical practice will engage doctors as independent contractors, but there are now various laws, including court decisions that look behind the contract itself to say, even if this is an independent contractor on paper, the terms of that contract uh, more genuinely reflect an employment relationship. And on that basis, you may have an independent contractor agreement with a doctor, but a state revenue office may deem them to be an employee, in which case they will become deemed employees with deemed wages under a relevant contract. And then that will be subject to payroll tax. With payroll tax, there are thresholds in the different states. In Victoria, as of this year, 1 July, um, the threshold is 900,000 annually or 75,000 monthly. So that what that means is, an organization won't be liable to pay payroll tax for its employees unless as an aggregate, and it could be multiple uh, clinics, let's say, as an aggregate, the amount of wages that are paid exceeds the 900,000 threshold. Other states, it's a bit higher, over a million. What I will focus on as part of this presentation will be the flow of funds. The view of event law is that that's the most critical feature of determining whether you have a relevant contract or not but it's not the only feature, uh, but it's important to keep in mind as I'll be showing you through the different aspects of the presentation I'll be doing with respect to relevant examples that we have from the state revenue offices about um, that uh, critical feature itself. So payroll tax has been around for a very long time, um, 2007 for Victoria and other states, but uh, even earlier for Queensland. And there's been a number of cases more recently that have really brought this to um, the fore and particularly the most popular case I'm assuming many of you will know about is the Thomas and Nias case um, from 2021. What's critical from that case is that of all the doctors that were engaged by the practice, three of them, uh, they had the patient funds flowing directly to their nominated account, meaning the patient billing um, and Medicare rebates, they weren't going through to uh, a clearing account held by the practice, rather it was going to the doctors themselves. And for that reason, those doctors and those contracts weren't calculated as part of payroll tax because they weren't deemed to be relevant contracts. So that's why that is such a critical feature and why you will have heard presentations or attended conferences that deal specifically on that point, on the flow of funds, because from a legal advisor's point of view, that is the most critical feature to determining whether you have a relevant contract or not. So there are other cases, including Victoria, where this was looked at, but uh, the majority seems to be coming out of New South Wales. 
including the most recent Uber case, which I'll touch upon shortly. So when it comes to determining whether your practice uh, is liable for payroll tax in terms of the engagements it has with its doctors, there's a five-step process that we recommend that needs to be followed and it's consistent with the payroll tax legislation and the different payroll tax rulings from the uh, state revenue offices. So first thing you wanna ask yourself, is your doctor an employee? Well, if you engage a registrar, for example, they are usually an employee. If you gauge a doctor that's already fellowed, has a number of years of experience, um, they're less likely to be an employee, but more likely to be on one of your independent contractor agreements. So the next question is, even if they are an independent contractor, can they be deemed an employee? Um, and if there's a possibility that they are deemed an employee, they're more likely to be under a relevant contract, which is subject to payroll tax. And if there is a relevant contract, the next question you want to ask yourself is, do any of the exemptions apply? And if not, what are the actual wages under the contract that are deemed wages that are subject to payroll tax? And the Uber case is significant for that. So there's been, prior to this big decision in Queensland, there's been a lot of harmony in terms of how the payroll tax, uh, the state revenue offices have been deciding whether uh, a practice may be liable for payroll tax. And it's according to the different state revenue office rulings that are publicly available. Now, these rulings are not the law, but they're the interpretation of the revenue offices in the different states and territories about whether there is a relevant contract or not and how they interpret it according to the payroll tax legislation. For present purposes, even for Queensland as it is now until there's the change, there are four relevant, there are four contract, sorry, there are four states in which there are um, what we refer to as relevant contract states. Um, and this is New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria, and Queensland. Now, of all the different rulings from the state revenue offices, the most helpful one for legal practitioners and for yourselves, if you wanted to have a look, is this payroll tax ruling from Queensland. They have the most examples, um, really helpful diagrams, which I'm going to go through as well, to give you a really clear indication of where um, liability is more likely to fall in the sense that you do or do not have a relevant contract or whether the wages are deemed wages for the purposes of payroll tax. So if you haven't looked at it already, it's really helpful to do so after this presentation. It'll give you more context in terms of what I've been speaking about, but also give you a better idea of uh, perhaps how the state revenue offices in Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales will be uh, making those kinds of decisions on assessments about whether there is a relevant contract or not. So in terms of what is a relevant contract, uh, the legislation and the interpretation by the state revenue offices is that they'll look at it from three vantage points. Firstly, there's got to be a practitioner carrying on a business or a medical practice that's providing medical related services to patients. So those medical related services can include the reception and the billing. In the course of conducting the business, the medical practice, firstly, it provides members with access to those medical related services, as I just mentioned, but otherwise, it engages a practitioner to supply services to patients on behalf of the medical practice. So that is also really important is defining that relationship. Under the standard uh, independent contractor agreements that I've seen when I've been working with my clients is that it, it is the practice that's engaging the doctor to provide these services. And what I'll be speaking to you about is reversing that position. And thirdly, you, uh, the question will be whether there is an exemption that applies. So I've taken this directly from the Victorian payroll tax ruling because I think it's relevant for all of you to have an understanding of the lens they use when they're looking at um, how a medical practice operates, how it engages with doctors and the interactions with the patients. So as you see in this case, um, and I'm going to point my arrow to it, there's reciprocity here in terms of the, what the medical practice does and the practitioner. So it's the practitioner that's treating the patients and paying a service fee to the medical practice. There's an agreement about shared obligations. So the practice itself will provide facilities, uh, support staff, and various services uh, that are related to um, administration, including billing. Um, but it's the patients that will be paying 
uh, fees to um, the medical practice under the what are now the standard independent contractor agreements. And as I'll be talking about in the next slides, uh, what we like to do with event law is to advise our clients that that is likely to be a relevant contract, but if you don't want to have that, the flow of funds should go directly to the doctor. So this is a really helpful slide, um, and it's I've taken it directly from the Queensland payroll tax ruling. Um, and if you look at the way it's set up, it gives examples of different payment arrangements and what is a deemed wage. And you'll see there's a lot of yeses there. The only one that's no is critical here. And it says it's where Medicare benefits are assigned by the patient to the doctor and any out of pocket expenses are paid directly to the doctor by Medicare. So what you're seeing here is that the flow of funds is always going directly to the doctor and not to any third party. So example 12 from the Queensland payroll tax ruling makes that really clear. It says if the money goes from the patient to the practitioner, there's no deemed wage. So that's really important because in effect, a patient cannot be an employer of a doctor that they're getting uh, treatment from. So I think David is much better putting together slides than myself, so you'll forgive me. I've got a attempt at a circle here. That's my own hand drawing. It's terrible, but it's gonna stress the point and I'm gonna come to shortly. So everything you see in red is from me, but otherwise this is an example from the Queensland payroll tax ruling. So what it's showing is a very complicated process of the flow of funds, starting from the patient here, eventually making its way down to the doctor. What it's saying is, where the money is going from the patient to um, the practice itself, um, as you can see here, that it's not a wage. So this part is not a wage, but where it goes from the practice to the doctor or to the doctor's company, that's deemed a wage. So what you're seeing here is anytime money is flowing not directly to the doctor, it's likely to be considered a deemed wage. So what I want you to do when I present the next couple of PowerPoint slides that deal with different examples from the Queensland payroll tax ruling is to change everything you see where it says uh, a practice or a trust entity or another company, replace that with practitioner. Because once it goes from patient to practitioner, there, can, there should not be um, a deemed wage because again, patients cannot be employers of a, a doctor. But implicit in these slides is that, that if you have that arrangement, it's not going to be a deemed wage. And so again, here, um, another process where it goes from patient to eventually get to the practitioner interposed by another company, that's deemed a wage. Another example, it goes from the patient to um, the doctor's company before it gets to the doctor. And when it goes from the doctor's company to the doctor, that's a deemed wage. But replace Synco here with a practitioner, and you're unlikely to have a deemed wage. And it's the same thing with the trust. So all of these examples are essentially highlighting, unless it goes from the patient directly to the doctor, you're likely to have a deemed wage. And so you can try to be as ingenious as you want in terms of finding other strategies that may be elaborate to having holding companies, clearing companies, third-party companies, anything else. But according to the State Revenue Office, their view is that unless it goes directly to the doctor from the patient, you're more likely to have a deemed wage scenario under a relevant contract. So when we move on to that aspect of the things, um, it's important to look at what is considered a deemed wage. So what does the legislation actually say? And there's been much talk now in the industry about how Uber has been groundbreaking in this. Um, I don't want to be a naysayer, but what I'll, the viewpoint we have at Event Law is that the circumstances of the Uber case are really unique and not necessarily applicable to the kinds of arrangements that a practice has with its doctors under a service agreement or an independent contract agreement. So I mentioned earlier that there are a number of states that are considered the relevant contract states and includes Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia. Well, in each of the payroll tax acts for uh, these states, section 35, one has the same wording. 
And it says a deemed wage will be for or in relation to the performance of work relating to a relevant contract. Two interesting cases have come out of New South Wales. That seems to be the focus here um, in terms of where the big decisions are coming from and with completely different results. In both cases, it was deemed that uh, there was a, a relevant contract, but in the latter in Uber that it wasn't a deemed wage. So it gets a little bit funny there. So there's a lot of gray area. But basically under the Home Loan and Market Group case, this was decided by the New South Wales Supreme Court. This was back in June, 2024. It didn't concern doctors, it was mortgage brokers. They were paid a commission via a clearing account. Um, and it was deemed to have a relevant contract and deemed taxable wages. This is on the basis that a judge in the New South Wales Supreme Court in June, 2024 said, look, when we're uh, trying to interpret what section 35 means, you need nothing more than an indirect relationship between two different subject matters. And that was by reference to the wording of the decision in the Thomas and Nas case. And then we got a completely contradictory <laughs> decision by a, a different judge of the exact same court and some months later in September for the Uber case. So again, not doctors, but still relevant circumstances for our consideration. So with the Uber case, you have transport drivers, they're paid fees via client, a clearing account, and it adds after the deduction of a service fee. What the judge said in that case, and I don't wanna be overly technical, but it's relevant for the context of, of this presentation, is that there needs to be sufficient reciprocity between the payments and the services received when you're trying to uh, interpret what is the meaning behind section 35.1 for a deemed wage. And I think it was appropriate for the judge to make these observations because it'll be relevant to how it relates to the engagement between doctors and a practice. So what the judge said here was that the rider pays the driver it is for work done in uh, by or relation to the driver. So this is the payment from the rider to the driver. What Uber pays the driver is in relation to the payment Uber has received, not in relation to the actual work done by the driver. So the driver is performing services for the patient um, and not for Uber. And so according to the judge, there's not enough reciprocity there to say there's a deemed wage for the purposes of that section. So yes, there's a relevant contract, but no, there's no deemed wage. What's really important um, in that case is how the judge clarified why it's important to look at the contract itself and what are the terms. So there's been some recent decisions from the highest court in Australia, um, the high court, which says whenever, whenever you want to look at whether there's an employee or employer relationship versus a principal and a contractor, you have to look at the terms of the contract. It's really relevant. And in this case, what did Uber do for its drivers? Well, it did not supply them with the cars. What it gave them is an app, an app that connected them to the riders. So the app was the most important thing. It's a um, connection to IT systems and to software. But that's all Uber really did. Uber didn't do, um, uh, didn't provide them with, uh, like I said, cars. And in the context of a, what a medical center does for the doctors, doesn't, uh, there was no provision of facilities and services of the kind that the doctor receives from the uh, practice. So the practice will do, give them consulting rooms, it'll give them support staff, gives them a premises to use to consult from, um, it offers assistance with billing, reception. So there's a lot more involved in terms of what a medical practice does for the doctor. So there's a lot more reciprocity in terms of the engagement between the doctors, the patients, and the practice. And so although the Uber case may be a, a, what could be deemed as a favorable for um, determining something not to be a deemed wage, you have to put into the context of what Uber did for did and didn't do for its drivers as compared to what a medical practice does for its doctors and the patients, where I would argue that there's more reciprocity than there was in the Uber case. So an important decision, but in the context of medical practices, from our point of view, um, not necessarily means that it's going to be favorable. So if you remember in my five-step test, if you think there's a relevant contract and there is a deemed wage, the next thing you wanna ask yourself, is there an exemption? And so for all of the states, these are the, the three exemptions. I'm gonna focus on exemptions one and three because number two is very obvious. 
that the doctors you engage are there as independent contractors for 90 days or less in a financial year. Now, when it comes to the first exemption about providing services to the public generally, this is really hard exemption to get. You essentially have to apply to the commissioner for determination. And the reason being is you wanna look at what are the services being performed by the doctor at one clinic versus another, and are the clinics uh, owned by the same owners? So if you have a doctor that's basically engaging um, not full-time uh, hours at one clinic and not full-time hours at another clinic, it's more than likely to be not a relevant contract according to example 3.1. So this is from the Victorian payroll tax ruling. On the other hand, if you've got a doctor that's engaging most of their time in one clinic, let's say full-time basis, five days a week, but for that same service provider does extra work with patients at their home, unless it's a significant amount with some parity, meaning more equality, it's unlikely to be uh, an exemption that applies because they're only doing one to two hours serving patients at their home. That's not really services to the public generally. That's just a, a minute amount. So you have to put it into context. And it's the same thing where, let's say, as a business, you own uh, maybe four clinics and you have doctors working at the different clinics. You might say, well, look, they're providing services generally to the public because they're doing work at these different clinics. But according to the state revenue office, if those clinics are all owned by the same entity, the same business, the same practice, in effect, well, then they're not really working for the public generally. They're working for your practice, but at the different practice clinics. So this is a very hard exemption to, um, to get approval for. And you have to go directly to the state revenue commissioner for that. Exemption three is where the work's performed by two or more persons. Again, this is only going to apply uh, on the basis of example five. If the doctor you have is directly employing, so your doctor is an independent contractor, is directly employing the support staff. If the support staff are being employed by the practice itself, well, then the exemption is not going to apply. So that's clear from example five. The reference there um, or illustration is to dentists, but the idea is the same. Unless the doctor is engaging the uh, support worker, like a nurse, directly, meaning paying for them, their wages, it's not going to be an exemption that applies um, under exemption three. So many of you, I would think, have heard the expression, don't get caught with your pants down. One of you we take at event law is, if you don't want to be liable for payroll tax, don't get caught with a relevant contract in the first place. Because all of those steps I went through only apply if your practice has a relevant contract with the independent doctors. So if there is a relevant contract, um, you go through that uh, five-step process to decide whether an exemption applies and whether there's a taxable wage. But if you don't have a relevant contract in the first place, none of this applies. It means that you, you don't have any liability for payroll tax because you don't have a relevant contract. So the way we like to do it at Event Law is to redefine the relationship. So rather than the practice engaging the doctor to provide the services, what the relationship should in fact be as reflected in the contract is that it's the doctor that's providing the medical services to the patients. The patients belong to the doctor. And what the doctor is doing is it's engaging the practice to give it support services, administrative and facilities. So the relationship is completely flipped. Whereas a relevant contract, it's the practice engaging the doctor. In our view, you wanna change that up to have the doctor engaging the uh, practice. You wanna work with your doctor so the fees are paid directly to their accounts. That was clearly demonstrated from the Thomas and Nas case, as I mentioned earlier with those three doctors, but also the helpful examples I took from the Queensland payroll tax ruling. Work with your bank managers, um, get a point of sale machine, the Tyron high caps, and just make sure that funds are allocated to the doctor that was treating the patient from that patient. So the funds go directly to the doctor rather than to any other clearing account. And I know there's been some concerns raised when I've been working with my uh, clients as to how the uh, practice is going to recover its fees for the service fee if it doesn't come directly to them. Um, yes, there could be a little bit more of an administrative burden, but there are ways to manage that through the contract. Um, and things to avoid, specifying mandatory hours of work is one of them. 
David made a really good point, which is you could have a practice clinic um, where you need doctors after hours. So it could be open 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. According to the payroll tax rulings, if you're going to be mandating what a doctor does, then they're not independent contractor, they're an employee. So you wanna try avoiding those mandatory hours, but you can work with your doctor to have agreed hours. So some can work at specific sessions that are in the afternoon and others in the morning. So it just comes to an agreement between um, the practice and the individual doctors about what are the agreed hours of work. But it's, it's collaboration it's coordination, it's not dictating to them what are their specified hours, because you only specify hours for an employee, not for an independent contractor. Leave policies only apply to employees. If you have an independent contractor, they're not entitled to leave, so it shouldn't be in your agreements. Patient records, they should be owned by the doctor, not the practice, but we have a mechanism in our service agreements that we use for our clients to make sure that the practice always has access and use of those records and certainly avoid any restraint of trade clause. If you want to claim your doctor's independent, but you're restraining them from working elsewhere, they're clearly not an independent doctor, they're an employee. So I'm going to try to flat, uh, go quickly through these because I know time is approaching. Um, it's quite late and I don't want anyone to be missing dinner because of me. Mm -hmm. So your contracts are the most important thing. That's what the judge said in the Uber case, but that's what all the judges have been saying in the high court as well. Look at your contracts, Firstly, secondly, you want to avoid certain things that have what are called implicating language to suggest that the relationship you have with the doctors is one of an employee employer relationship. So you want to review your um, website and your social media. You don't want to say our doctors because that means they're employees. You can just refer to them as the doctors. That's simple. You want to update your registration forms with patients so the patients understand that they're seeing a doctor and they're patients of the doctor, not the practice because the practice is not giving them medical treatment. The practice is just giving support services to the doctor so they can deliver the medical services to the patient. And if you do have surgical or nursing patients, based on the example I gave earlier, um, are you getting the doctors to employ them or are you employing them? But again, the key here is if there's gonna be any liability for payroll tax, it's on the basis that it goes the, the wages that are paid to everyone as an aggregate is above the 900,000 threshold. So you're unlikely to have that if you're not paying wages to your doctors. What's really important for Victoria um, is that what it seems to be doing is following the same process in South Australia and New South Wales, which is a focus on getting a rebate or an exemption, but only to GPs, so not, not other specialists and only if they've registered with the state revenue office for payroll tax. Um, and it's gonna be focused on bulk billing only. So um, there's gonna be uh, legislation that it, it still has to get passed, but it's in the works about having these exemptions up until July 1 next year for the contractor GPs, but only for bulk billing. Um, and the uh, exemption will apply till 2025 only where the practice has already hasn't received advice, le legal advice or advice from the state revenue office that it's not liable for payroll tax and it's begun paying payroll tax. So again, to get these exemptions is really difficult. Um, and if what's happened in Queensland can be replicated um, in all the other states, great. But if it doesn't, then what's likely gonna happen is the model that's going to be implemented in South Australia and New South Wales, which is a focus on exemptions only being available for bulk billing and nothing else. So I'll very quickly fly through these key takeaways. But basically, if the State Revenue Office wants to assess your practice to determine whether payroll tax is um, payable for relevant contracts and deemed wages, they're gonna look at it on a one-to-one -one basis. So it's always case by case. There's no one size fit all approach. You want to assess your current risks and work out what to do. Focus on the flow of funds, as I've been talking about. Speak to your legal advisors and to your accountants. What's on the service agreement should also be on the ground. So just because your agreement says they're independent contractors, but if you have total control over them, that means what's happening on the ground is not reflective of the agreement. And the uh, payroll tax office will look beyond the agreement to say, hey, um, the agreement says one thing, but in reality, you're doing another. And so you, you're likely more likely to have a relevant contract. So the things to avoid, again, are restraints, rosters, and things like that. And just ensure that whatever's 
services are being provided by the practice to the doctor are purely administrative and uh, in, in that respect, but also facilities. So giving them the consultation rooms to use. And of course, if, you, um, if you're not fussed at all about payroll tax um, and you consider that your agreements and maybe based on legal advice that you are liable for payroll tax, well then what you should be doing is just set up, keep your agreements the way they are, um, apply to the state revenue office, Victoria here for um, some relief um, and just be prepared to pay payroll tax. So for some medical centers, this is a, a big deal. For others, it's not. It's really up to you um, on that sense. But you should, any decision you make, it should be based on legal and accounting advice before you approach the payroll tax office to determine whether um, you're liable for payroll tax and whether any exemptions apply. So that's it for me. Um, I've tried to fly through it. I hope I've covered the ground um, as much as I can. Um, I am essentially available for Q&A as well, um, but at the same time, uh, if because it's so late, um, you wanted to message me directly, you can find my details on our Event Law Commercial website, including my email, and you can just get in touch with me directly um, and we can talk from there. But otherwise, thank you very much again, everyone, for the opportunity to present this uh, to you. And thanks, Abigail. Thanks, David. Thanks, Marco. We actually do have a question in the chat. Okay. Yeah, so um, just from Emma, she wants to know, how does the notion that that the patient is that of the doctor as opposed to the practice impact my Medicare seeing patients need to be registered with a, with a clinic and select a doctor? So I think that's just referring to the my Medicare registration process and how, the potential impacts on payroll tax. Yeah, and that's a really good question. That's something we're going to look into. So I don't want to give a response without preempting it, but it's something we're uh, definitely going to be advising our clients on. Um, it's a complicated issue because what's really happening is we're moving to digitization as much as possible. And that's really blurring the lines in many ways in terms of what are the roles of the, the service provider as the service entity and the doctor when it comes to dealing with patients. But essentially from a best practice perspective, it really is the patience of the doctor. Um, and as the example was shown in the Queensland payroll tax ruling, if the doctor is getting um, uh, the, if, if the Medicare is being assigned to the doctor rebate and all the flow of funds are going to the doctor, the patient belongs to the doctor, not the practice, because the focus of the practice is administrative and uh, support services and delivering facilities. So I know that doesn't fully answer the question. Um, it would be too early to speak on that now. But um, if um, this uh, delegate or attendee wanted to know more, uh, please email me. And that's something that we can speak to you about later if you wanted to get advice on it. But from our overall perspective, the patients do belong to the doctors, not the practice. And then that's on first principles. And then everything else we can help, we can help you with afterwards. Got another question uh, as well, and thank you for that answer. Uh, in relation to the doctors being considered tenant doctors, where does this leave practices in regards to accreditation? Shouldn't every doctor be accredited individually rather than the practice be accredited, which indicates they operate under practice orders? That could be a helpful question for uh, David to answer as well, because I don't want to speak about um, whether accreditation is... Um, good for practices or not. I think that's more of a question that's related to practitioners. But when it comes to tenant agreements, I'm certainly happy to talk about that. Um, when you use the term tenant, it carries a legal meaning. And I've had discussions with uh, clients and with other colleagues about whether a doctor is under a tenancy agreement or not. A true tenancy agreement means that the doctor at the practice that you're engaging them has exclusive possession. So exclusive possession means that consulting room is theirs and no one else's, and they have tenancy rights. And those tenancy rights uh, mean that they can exercise them against the landlord, not being able to access the room without giving notice. So it, whereas you'll have agreements that say they're tenancy agreements between a practice and a doctor, in reality, they're not because there's no exclusive possession the doctors don't have those same tenancy rights. And according to the Queensland payroll tax ruling, 
um, and even the Victorian one, if you're going to have a true tenancy agreement, then the doctor at that's consulting for you at the practice in that consultation room that they have exclusive possession over, they're also doing their own billing. They do their own administrative services or they hire someone to do it that they pay as an employee. So it doesn't come through the um, practice entity because the practice entity is the landlord. So if you hear terminology about tenant doctors, the view of event law is that it's incorrect um, and it's supported by what's in the payroll tax rulings. But when it comes to the accreditation of the practice through the RACGP, I don't think I'm the right person to comment on that. David, maybe think, you can help with that. I mean, I think that there's a um, there's a mixed logic um, uh, both the um, the rulings about payroll tax and the requirements for accreditation come from different angles. While they talk about the same space on the map, um, they're seeing the uh, institutions and the, the structures differently. Um, for example, a practice is able to change its locks and give you a key, and that doesn't make you an employee of the practice just because they're telling you you need to use this key in the same way that a practice can't operate as an accredited practice unless it's accredited. That means setting up a framework for have, having doctors to work in the way that practice requires. So in the same way as you might change the locks and give someone a key, you can change the rules around how to practice inside that practice without necessarily triggering any change in the relationship between the doctor uh, and that accredited practice. Um, but there is gonna be um, there's, there's different structures to set up different considerations for the business, the, the payroll tax issue and accreditation. So they're never going to perfectly align from a logic perspective. And that's a great point, David. I just want to add to that, that there seems to be a budding of heads, which is why the um, the RSC, RSC GP has been really advocating for uh, abolition of payroll tax for um, GPs, for medical practices in that sense, because um, they're, they're coming from two different perspectives. Uh, and so it's important to keep that in mind anytime you're looking at it um, from the accreditation point of view, as David's pointed out, but I'll also refer back to the Uber case, which is even at the court level, they're looking at things differently. So the revenue office and the, looks at it from one perspective and the court will look at it from another and say, no, 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 this is not how it actually works in practice. You may think it's this way, but it's not. So there's always going to be a lot of gray when it comes to any issues related to payroll tax and its applicability to practices um, under the arrangements it has with its doctors. So um, there's always gonna be quite a bit of tension. And I think that's part of the reason that perhaps the uh, new Queensland government has decided to just get rid of it completely for GPs. But again, it doesn't apply to specialists. I hope Thank that you for helps the answer. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. I've got one more question. Uh, so from Madeline, she wants to know, should independent contractors be able to determine our own fees under this new arrangement? That's really important. Um, and that's what we advise our clients that, yes, that's the case. They should be determining their own fees uh, when it comes to what they're billing uh, the patients. But what they'll need to be mindful of is whatever the service fee is, that's, that's going to be subject to change according to um, the, the contractual agreement. But ordinarily, if doctors want to demonstrate their true independence, setting their own fees is one way of doing it. And so you have to be mindful of um, what's on your website. So as I mentioned, you can have certain details on your website that relate to the different doctors that operate there. But when it comes to setting a fees, um, you want to be mindful of what's put on the website and what's not. And again, um, David, maybe... As a practice owner and a successful one, you may have some uh, tips on that as well. Well, the ACCC stopped um, specialists from uh, aligning their fees, uh, whereas GPs are allowed to have the same fees by agreement. So it's a slightly different landscape for, for mm. my practice, but there's a lot of sense in being independent and setting your own fees as the um, doctor. Uh, administration nightmares that the, G, that the general practice will talk about are dealt with in specialty practices or, uh, you know, like practices like mine anyway. So it's not impossible to do. Mm. And that's a really good point with the ACCC and cartel conduct and everything else. So it's um, it, it can be really tricky to navigate from a legal perspective, which is why it's always uh, important that um, you do speak to your legal and accounting advisors whenever you have any concerns. Um, as it relates to um, issues that are relevant to the contract between the doctor and the practice. 
Thank you for that one. It seems I've got another question that's come through, which is great. Uh, Rod wants to know what happens with the patients and records if the GP leaves the practice? Yes, yeah, so that's something I'll, I'll also invite um, David to answer upon because he, he's in actual practice, whereas I'm advising doctors on it. From the way we have our arrangements um, with our service agreements, it's essentially that, again, the patient records belong to the doctor, but the, um, the practice will always have access to them. And you're going to get that through the uh, practice management software anyway. But if the doctor wants to take their patient records, well, they belong to the doctor, so they should be able to take them. But if there's going to be a transfer from one clinic to another, well, then it might be reasonable pay administration fee. But uh, again, David, um, uh, happy for you to chime in and, and um, put your two cents on that. No, I think uh, that's right. It's it's nice to think that the, the practice can hold it. If you're retiring or you don't want the records, it's good that someone else is going to hold them for you. You don't have to worry about it because you, if you are leaving the practice with the records, you do have to look after them. So there is an option there. Um, but no, I just agree. With, I agree with the points that, that you've made. It's it's not unreasonable for a practice to put an administration fee on producing those records. Um, if that's a disincentive to leave, uh, but the you know the doctor's notes are the doctor's notes, right? Mm -hmm. This is why it's great working with David. <laughs> <laughs>